Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. We are sitting here with my good friend, Mr. Willie Green, Mr. Paul Willie Green Womack. Yes, glad to be here. Always amazing to see you. And uh, it hasn't been that long since I've seen you, maybe a, like a month or two since we were in New York at the last AES, which is always, always fun. This year, I thought in particular, was pretty amazing. It was great this year. It was kind of a bit of a reunion. You know, it kind of had that reunion feel. We've been doing a lot with the AES virtually for the last couple of years, dealing with the pandemic and all that. But it's nice to be back in person and see your friends and give your friend a hug and all that kind of stuff. The stuff we used to take for granted being so normal. Um, this year, you know, big turnout and everybody was kind of ready to get back and back into the swing of things. We actually uh, came over to hang out with you. We did a studio tour. We did a couple of other videos. And we also did a course with you, which is always rather wonderful. The course that we did, I'm really excited about. It's from an album that uh, I had mixed and mastered over the summer, this group Shrapnel, two of my favorite MCs. So I was glad to be able to share some of that and the, the inner workings of what we do in the greenhouse. What I love about you is that you are a full-blown working 24 hours a day producer, engineer like myself. And you're like kind of the Brooklyn version, which is great. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm I'm lucky to to be someone who, you know, every day I get up and I make records every day. You know, I don't take it for granted. Uh, in this industry, people do a lot of other things and there's all the hats and everything that everybody wears. And I wear a few, but I just love making records, you know, like that's still in the, my essence. I'm, I'm a I'm a record maker. And so I'm lucky that I get to do that every day. Now, do you feel, because one of the questions I get asked all the time, you know, how do you get work? Are you, do you feel most of it at this stage in your career is word of mouth, records you've already done, people have worked with you going, oh yeah, you must work with him, you know, is, is it like that? Or are you still getting kind of cold call, kind of somebody finds you and what, where, where's your work mainly coming from? At this point, it's mostly word of mouth. I'm lucky to work with a lot of really great artists. So as their music is spreading and gaining momentum, you know, somewhere on the back of that of that vinyl is my name. And the label I work with, Backwood Studios, the whole roster has really been picking up a lot of steam and doing some incredible stuff. And I'm a big part of all of that. So, you know, it all, all kind of rolls like that. But there's always a cold call here and there. And, you know, I've still got the old the old mindset. When the phone rings, I answer and I take the gig. And then we figure out how to do it. You know, I'm never, never turning down a whole bunch of stuff because I've still got that hustle mentality, uh, just that old school take every session because you never know. You never know who's on the who's on the other end of the line. Yeah, absolutely. You don't know where the work's going to come from. I, I've also found over the years that I'll do a song like ten years ago, forget all about it, and then I get a phone call and an email that says, "Oh, by the way, we just synced it to this commercial or this thing," and. You know, you're going to get a small check and now some res extra residual income that you never thought you were going to have. And then the other thing I always explain to people, and maybe you can ex expound upon this a little bit, is you don't know where the work's going to come from. Meaning, if somebody hires you to do just one element of something, like, can you just do the vocal? Could you just mix it? Could you just master it? Can you just do an overdub? Can you, whatever, whatever small element of something, whether it's large or small, they're all great calling cards. And so I'm always encourage people to just interact and collaborate with people on any aspect of the recording process. It's critical. You know, we all spend a lot of time in our own rooms, our own spaces, hunkered over a keyboard making our records. But you don't know what one thing is going to turn into a whole big thing. You know, earlier in my career, I had a great experience with that. I got called in uh, to, a, to a studio in Manhattan just to do a quick edit. So we're going to fly in a vocal from one song, place it in here. It's supposed to be like an hour's maybe a work or whatever, and just be done. And I get in there and I do the edit. And the artist shows up and says, all right, well, the choir's going to be here in a half hour. Drummer's on his way upstairs. And the guitar, uh, the guitar player wants to know what amps you have. And, you know, like, the job is to be ready. What I can't do is say, oh, well, I wasn't prepared for any of that because I'm out the door immediately and someone else is going to come in and be in the seat. And so that hour I was supposed to do turned into four days of tracking and editing for uh, for Donnie McClurkin, a big gospel artist. And I wound up, Amazing. you know, working on a ton of that album because I was prepared to do it, even though I was called in just for a quick vocal edit. That's a wonderful, wonderful example. Uh, <laughs> the coffee maker. <laughs> Can you hear that? 
We've got our new coffee maker, everybody. We've got a guest feature here. A guest feature, yeah, guest feature. Guest feature of our spin coffee maker. And this is my first first coffee with it because I only really drink tea. But I said to Eric, I want a cup of coffee. There you go. Well, this is it for the internet. This is like the unboxing, the the the, the uncorking video. Well, it, it made its presence felt because apparently, well, not apparently, it just did. It grinds the coffee beans specifically for the cup. So you just put your cup in oh, there and wow. it only grinds it for the one cup you make, which I think is pretty, pretty fantastic. So yeah. we'll see. We'll I'm going taste it in a minute. Other tips and other experiences you've had, uh, uh, the things that you've done that have got you work. Is that that any sort of, because it really is, I think, once I distill through questions that people want to know from you and from all of us, that's the one that always comes out. It's like, how am I going to get work? I suppose the next question is, you are in a major metropolis. You're in New York. You're also in one of the hippest parts of New York where there's an incredible music scene. I mean, we were there a few weeks ago and it was great guitar store, orphan guitars. And there was just a great vibrancy. We went into, um, Lee and I went in to get sandwiches for everybody. And this couple come in, uh, a girl with a guitar on her back. And I think the the other guy had like a bass on his back and they just came in and casually ordered a coffee. And I was like, this is, this is a hub for music. So my question is, is like, do you feel like that's a big part of success of building a career is to move somewhere like that? Or do you feel like still a lot of your work is remote? It's a bit of both. Growing up, you know, I grew up in Connecticut and Hartford and musicians in Hartford, as you grow up, a lot of us, our goal is to move down here to the city, right? Um, and so that's what I did, you know, by way of music school and other stuff. Um, but I made it down here, and it does make a difference to a degree. But as connected as we all are digitally, and it's made the world smaller, we still have regional styles, regional music, and there's still a scene wherever you go. You know, and you can see on tours, you know, I've been to, I've done hip hop shows in Des Moines, Iowa, or hip hop shows in northern Wisconsin, you know, um, places you wouldn't necessarily expect, but there are scenes everywhere because there are people making music everywhere. And, you know, I get the question a lot as well, well, how do I get started? Go to shows in your area. Wherever you are, there are musicians around. Go to shows, meet them. If you like them, say, hey, you know, I'm an up-and-coming producer. I'd love to play some of my beats for you. Come by my studio. Or if you ever need someone to record vocals for you, I love your voice. You know, here's my information. Let's connect. Um, Because odds are the musicians are looking for people to connect with as well. Even though we work in our little bubbles everybody still wants to branch out of that and connect with others because that gains momentum when you don't have to do everything all by yourself. So no matter where you are, reach out to those people around you, but you can also do that online and there's a lot more ways to network than really ever before. I agree. That's a good example. I use that one as well myself a lot. Eric's bringing over the coffee. You look a bit suspicious, Eric. Is it good? Right, pressure's on. Oh, that's good. Woo! That's good because it's just got that freshly ground beans flavor. That is live reaction, folks. That is right oh. here in front of you. Woo! Is this the rocket? <laughs> Which one did you hit? <laughs> no, no, it's just coffee. It's just a regular coffee? Regular well, you can tell I'm not re- don't drink that much coffee because this regular coffee is like <laughs> that perks delicious, you up immediately. Yes, I, I often say the same thing. Um, I did a lot of that shows. I also got involved with rehearsal studios. So, oh, that's a good one. Yeah, I had a I had a home set up when I moved to Los Angeles, which was ADATS and a soundtracks console. It was like a, I think it was like a thirty two channel Topaz, and it was a great little console, really fiddly, you know, very small format, but many many channels, you know. And um, I started recording bands and artists at my house, at my well, my house, my apartment. And I sort of outgrew it. I started wanting bands to record that was super loud. So I I started going around rehearsal studios and I found this one rehearsal studio that had a little control room and a rehearsal room attached to it, but no recording equipment. So I brought in my recording equipment and started recording bands. And it was it was pretty amazing. And I got some really good breaks because the bangles came in because they were getting back together to tour and they were starting to write a new album. And this was like 99, 2000. And I was like pretty fresh off the boat in America. And 
I just recorded them. That gave me more work. And they went to another rehearsal, a bigger rehearsal room to, to, to record. And the owner of that studio said to me, come and partner with me, bring in your recording equipment, and I'll give you a piece of my business and you'll be our house engineer. And that was huge. And so I kind of like got into a record uh, into a recording rehearsal studio like that. So I think maybe the lesson for that is to maybe go to rehearsal rooms and reach out to bands and maybe see if they've got recording in there, maybe become like a house engineer. I mean, the hours are horrible, as you can imagine, working in rehearsal rooms. I was, I was working like 11 till three most. That's three in the morning, most, most days. And then sometimes I would work through the night and work through the next day and then collapse, go home at 6 p.m. and sleep till 10 and go back again. But I went from being not knowing how to run a DAW, not knowing Pro Tools at all, to being like super, super fast on it. And I often say, maybe this is what you can elaborate on. I think I got good at my craft by working with not very good artists. Yeah, I think there's something to that for a few different ways. First, you learn the trouble, the the, the troubleshooting and the problem solving, right? Yeah. You know, if someone's not a great drummer, Part of that is the tone that they're getting out of the drums. You know, it's not just time, it's tone and it's feel. So maybe you have to work a little bit harder on your drum sounds or something like that. You know, also it's going to teach you personal skills, how to be patient, how to get the best out of performers. You know, patience is, is, su patience is such a big thing in production, right? Being able to work with people and all their different nuances and tendencies and all that kind of stuff and draw the best the best performances out of out of bands and out of performers that's the job all the knobs and plugins and stuff is all secondary to inter, to the interpersonal uh, relationships so just learning how to deal with people you know and also learning patience for yourself there's a lot of people, whether they come out of music school or they just got, you know, some gear and they decide they're really going to go for this and they're, you know, starting to make records and it's and they're like, well, how come I'm not huge like A, B, and C? Well, there's a long way to go. There's a long road for this, you know, YouTube videos that will just say, do X, Y, and Z and you'll be famous. It's, it, it doesn't work like that. There's a process to it. And so learning the process for yourself and how to be patient and where you need to grow is also a very big part of it. Thank you for highlighting the people skills part because that's huge. And it's something I I did learn and I, I got relatively good at, but I don't think it really hit home to me until I started working with Jack Douglas because I get into a room with Jack Douglas, who's produced all of these massive records like Toys and Rocks, and, you know, Toys in the Attic, Rocks, and, and, and Double Fantasy, John Lennon, all these like massive, massive, hugely influential albums. And he makes everybody in the room feel special. Doesn't matter if you're the bass player, the drummer, the lead guitar player, the rhythm guitar player, the singer. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what your role is in the band. He's not one of those producers that goes and, and goes to the singer and starts flattering the singer because maybe they're the main melody writer and lyricist. Maybe they're the consistent like leader of the band or whatever. He does not do that. He doesn't make anybody more important than the other. Creates a really harmonious atmosphere where all creativity comes to light. Somebody, you know, the bass player, maybe on another person's song, comes up with a super hook line. And then before you know it, it's the main hook of the song and the guitar player's doubling it. And, you know, it, that doesn't happen in environments where producers sort of like create a hierarchy. And I've been an engineer with producers that create hierarchies. And I've made records where, sometimes good records, I've made records where I've ended up playing a lot of the guitars and some of the bassists when I was the engineer and I was playing a lot of the instruments. We'd hire a drummer and all that stuff and just use the singer. And it was under a band name. And the album I, I'm thinking of did well. It was quite a successful record, but it didn't help the band and it didn't help the players. It was like, it was all just about getting from A to B. And then when I worked with Jack later, I was like, I could have got that, done that same record, helped elevate all of the musicians in the band, and they would have become better. They would have come back for another record rather than just doing the one, because that's what happens. When you treat the band like servants to their own music, it just becomes... You know what I mean? They, they 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 don't love you. They don't want to work with you again. That's a big part of it as well as the them wanting to come back. Because at the end of the day, we deal with clients. We want those clients to come back and patronize our services again. Um, but 
artists are still people, you know, for yep. all the drummer jokes or bass player jokes in the world. It's a person playing those drums and maybe, you know, she doesn't want to be minimized within her own band or whatever it is. And when you treat people with that respect, that's why they come back. Everybody's got a microphone. Everybody's got an interface or Pro Tools or something at this point, right? Like the technology is out there. What separates one engineer or producer from another is how you deal with those people. And if they like you, they're going to book you again. If you were a jerk in the session or moody, they're probably not going to. Do you have some examples? I'll, I'll give you a quick one. When I was working with uh, Steven Tyler, I noticed that he we were doing sessions starting at 10 a.m. and he would arrive. And then he'd leave about 12 or 1 and go to American Idol and film, then come back at 7 and work till 10 or 1 in the morning. So we would do these like 12-hour sessions and Joe, Joe would, Joe could be there early as well and stay late. But basically, you know, it was a for us, it was like a 13-hour, 14, 15-hour day sometimes. And, and, and that was fine because we were making a record and working with incredibly talented people. But for Stephen, I think it was even worse because he's having to sing both ends of the day and also be on on camera in the middle of it. And his work ethic was incredible. And I remember at the end of, of one session, maybe the 10th session like that of doing vocals, I said to him, well done. I said to him, that was an incredible vocal. You did an incredible job. And that might sound like really trite for me to say that, but I realize quite often with a lot of very talented people, and or even just people that are putting so much time and energy into it, it gets taken for granted. Like, oh, Stephen Tyler doesn't need to be complimented. He's he's sold 200 million records, you know. And you could see he had this big smile, and he was all just like like a little kid, like, oh, thanks, you, you like what I did. And we forget people are people. Exactly. You know, we put people on pedestals, or we think about them as commodities for how yeah. records are going to sell or whatever. End of the day, everybody likes a compliment, you know. Yeah. Or Especially when it's genuine and you've experienced it along the road with them, you know. It's it's easy to lip pay lip service. It's easy to say, yeah, man, you're amazing. But when you've been working together for something on many, many hours and you've really got into the nitty gritty, it's, it's important to recognize that in the artists and the people that you're working with. It really is. And that personal connection, you know, with me, the first time I really clicked in, uh, I was recording an artist and, you know, before we hit record, we're talking about the songs and whatever. I'm like, okay, what song are we doing today? What's the song about? You know, let's, let's, let's talk about the content. And the artist was like, you know, that's the first time that an engineer has ever just asked me what my song is about. Not, well, rap the second verse again, let's punch in here, but what are we doing here? What is what is all of this about? What's the story? How do we emphasize that and bring that out? Beautiful. Yeah, very really well said. That brings me to the next thing that when people ask me about getting work, it's also not just getting the work, but sealing the deal. So one thing I always tell people that's super, super important to me is that you get the cold call, you know, the email from somebody maybe you don't know, but has discovered you for some music you've done or another artist you've worked with. They'll come in and go, you know, I've got five songs. How much would it be to produce my music? And I tell people this all the time. I'd love to know your process, but I always say, do not bring up money. Ask to hear the music. Ask it because they, it, it, they, if, they're just, if they just want to know to work with you on, you know, I charge blah, 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 thousands of dollars to do this. That doesn't mean anything. Hear the music. It does one of two things. It, first of all, frankly, it just finds out whether they're serious. If they're serious enough and they've got demos or even voice memos of songs, that can be enough and you can get an idea of where you're going to want to take it. Um, but like, it's, I, I, I thought of it because you're pointing out something is like you're talking about, you know, the artist that said to you, thank you for like actually wanting to know what my song is about. What am I rapping about? What am I saying? That's super, super important, especially quite frankly. I was, we were at the bowling alley, Eric, the other night. And it was all 80s and early 90s hip hop. It was freaking awesome because we were like, this is the hip hop we remember that when people were actually trying to say something, you know, it was less pop. It was less, you know, it was like really good. And a lot, of course, East Coast stuff. Um, it was pretty amazing. But yeah, those guys have got something to say and they're, they're saying something that's quite charged, you know, politically and it means something and it's really pushing against barriers and stuff like that. And I think quite often in our industry, People forget that music can be really powerful, can help social change, help change things, economic change, quite frankly, in the world, you know. 
you know, so many things have been boiled down to content for reels and TikTok and whatever, you know, and that's fine for those who exist in, you know, certain parts of the industry. I I tend to work on a lot of records that are, you know, pretty heavy topically and, you know, and pretty, pretty dense. Um, my little corner of the indie hip hop world is very dense and very lyrical and, and, and involved. So, you know, for a, it really helps in a few different ways. First, it lets the artist know that I care and that I'm invested, right? So yeah, when we have yeah. that first meeting, the last thing I want to do is talk about money. I actually, I hate Agreed. to negotiate. I want to do the artistic part. So I have members of my team that negotiate on my behalf. I don't right. want to talk about the money. I just want to talk about the art. That's That's the part that I'm here for. Fantastic. But bringing it back to when you didn't have the team, Mm -hmm. what your process was, listen to the music, get a feel, I presume. I do all the time. Like, what can they really yeah. afford? What What is the budget? That That's also part of it. You may, you know, I could say, well, how much do you have? But yeah. the bigger question is, what do you want to do? What do you want to accomplish? And then we'll figure out what we need to do to make, to make that accomplishment. But I need to know what we're doing, what the artist has in mind, First, to you know, set their expectations. Also, to know if it's a right fit for me. Just because someone comes through the door, and you know, like I said, I take a lot of and most of what comes through the door. But if I'm not the right person, I'd rather send the artist to the right person and have them be happy. And I did somebody a favor somewhere, and then I'm working on music that I'm suited for, rather than futzing through an album that maybe I'm not the right engineer for and then nobody's happy, you know? So to make sure that it's a, that, that, that it's a good fit for everybody, I think is very important. Yeah, I think one of the things uh, you probably, uh, when did you sort of really start? Uh, early 2000s? When, what was early your sort 2000s, of yeah. I graduated uh, music school in 2003, uh, graduated from Berkeley and immediately opened a, a studio while also being a bartender and doing all of that. So yeah. Well, what's interesting, 2000s. I've got, I've got, I'm ten, I'm, I think I'm 10 years older than you, but what happened for me is like, I came to America as an artist in 95, um, end of, very end of 95, October. But so like, so 96, 97, 98 was all artist, was all, you know, band, touring and all that kind of stuff. And then spill over to 99, 2000. But by that point, like 99, 2000, when I got a studio, so I'm actually, we're on a very similar timeline. So you and I probably experienced very, very similar things because I felt like in the early 2000s, there was still that mm, kind of, you, you and I could demo and work with artists and develop them, but then they would just be plucked and taken away from us and dropped into the, the money pool of like the big name, I was about to say guys and girls, but it was all men in those days, just a big pile of, of dudes that were just making all the records. And it became very homogenized, as we know. Anybody who knows music from like early two thousands, it was just incredibly homogenized. Um, it was like a lot of the DAWs, you know, was wasn't open to everybody. The technology was really dictating the way music was recorded. Everything was copy and pasted. It was like rock in particular was at some of the worst. Some of the emo from that period is just copied and pasted choruses, you know, super right. over the top auto tuned vocals, you know, every drum, every bass, every guitar sound was the same on every single song. I don't yeah. know what it was like for hip hop. I wasn't following it as closely at that period. My, my time of hip hop was like eighties and early nineties. I love like disposable heroes of hypocrisy and stuff like that. That was huge and huge in Britain. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, uh, MC Solar from France and everything. It was a lot more yeah. European stuff that we had. A lot of, like, acoustic instruments in, in with the rap. Because there was a big acid jazz movement in the early 90s in England. And a lot of that was, like, hip-hop, you know, with um, with Guru and, and uh, yeah. all that stuff, which is just phenomenal. Even to this day, still sounds fresh. Still sounds new. Yeah, and I love, love jazz, so it was, like, so incredible. Anyway, I'm off on one of my famous tangents. The <laughs> business side in the early 2000s, it was still kind of a bit of a struggle. Did you find you were having to kick down doors and barriers? Because I, I had to do all the time. I would work with artists and get them to a level where they could be signed. And that was kind of the end. I would sort of wave sayonara and off they'd go into the big money pit of, of labels. And quite often my productions were just copied by people getting paid, you know, not even 10 times, more like 100 times the amount that I was getting paid. Yeah, 
Was that similar? Not exactly. A lot of what I was doing at the time was really underground stuff. You know, I graduated and I had the opportunity to go and work in big studios. And I was hard-headed and pretty sure of myself at the time. I said, I want to do it all my way and all this kind of stuff. So I started off uh, actually recording a bunch of metal bands. Uh, A buddy of mine who I graduated with was producing metal bands, and he knew that we had the studio, uh, myself and and the guys I, I built the studio with. Started off doing a lot of metal. I haven't listened to it in about 20 years. It's probably not very good. I want to hear your metal. This is great. Uh, well, I, I, I'll have to dig way in the vaults for that one. Um, but it was one of those experiences like, okay, here's a paying client. So let's figure out how to make these metal records because it's 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 the gig that, that, that I have and that's available. Um, and then I started focusing more and more on hip hop shortly after that. But, uh, you know, really underground stuff. Um, And a lot of it I look back on now and I I still think is really good. But that's a different set of challenges where we might do a project, but it might be two years before that artist calls you back or whatever. Because with the underground projects, the budgets are small. And so things aren't happening as often because everybody has day jobs and other bills that they need to take care of. And the recording really is a hobby at best. You know, right now it's a bit of a mix where I have a lot of clients that are just artists and that's the day job, but also plenty. It's like, yeah, I'm going to come in once every couple of weeks and do a couple hours, you know, vocals um, when I can take some time off of work. And, you know, that's that's just how a lot of people are making records now, especially in New York, because it's just cost prohibitive just to be out here just as an artist, you know, so we find different ways uh, to work with people's schedules. And, you know, just remember, these are just regular folks that maybe can sing really well or rap really well. And how do we put it all together? I think this is a really wonderful topic for a video to talk about, like how to get work, how to build relationships with clients. And it's true. I'm sure I had some some not so good experiences. I do know, you know, I've had a few interns come through that have worked really, really hard and have stuck with us. Eric is a prime example of somebody who worked his butt off and he, is it, he can hear me. So, <laughs> um, yeah. And then we've had some that have kind of phoned it in and arrive late every day and cut out early and all that kind of stuff. I will say I've got Eric, Laura, Phil, Brian, three of those four have won Grammys after working with us for a period of time some of the multiple Grammys. And I'm not saying I'm the catalyst. It sounds like I'm saying that. What I'm saying is all of those people, particularly Phil, worked for like 10 years with me, like doing everything, interning, engineering, then co-producing, then co-writing with me. Still co-writing. We're co-writing some tracks at the moment for a, for a movie. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask you about that. Film and TV, do you step outside of the role as producer and occasionally or often do music that's specifically written for film and TV? Not a ton. I've dealt a little bit with it. You know, some of those early gigs along with the metal bands, I was doing a bit of post uh, for a few films because, again, those are the calls that came in. And, you know, part of the thing about taking every call that comes in is you also recognize what you don't want to do. And I do not enjoy post. Uh, Praises to all those who who do it. I, you know, I watch a lot of movies and television, whatever, like everybody else. And so I appreciate those who do it well. And I'm also glad that it does not have to be me. I've done a little bit of, you know, music for picture and whatnot. And also, you know, a couple of times a year I get hit up for music for podcasts. You know, that's another, you know, podcast industry is huge now. And a lot of them want specifically, you know, music written for them, whether it's an intro or, you know, underscore or whatever. So I'll do I'll do a few of those gigs uh, every year, um, but not a lot. But it's always something that's in the back of my mind uh, because DJs don't break records anymore. Television shows do. You know, so whether it's a new season of Insecure on HBO or whatever it is, this is where new songs start to catch a lot of buzz. You know, I was saying to my assistant recently, watching the new show Wednesday on uh, on Netflix. Love that show. Love it. It's so good. It's so good. And the young lady who plays Wednesday is amazing. And I'm watching the show and I'm keeping my phone out 
Because at least once an episode, I'm shazamming something like, yo, what is that song in the background? Hold on, honey, I got to rewind. My wife gets sick of me because I got to rewind the end of scenes so I can find an open part with no dialogue. But that's where new records really get broken now more than more than just DJs, certainly more than radio. And so that's kind of a looming presence kind of in everybody's existence is, yeah, we need to get that placement. We need that sync placement. You know, so it's 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 an interesting landscape with with that being such a such a prevalent part of it. There's so much great content being made now because all bets are off in all industries, particularly film and TV. There's so many barriers that have just been kicked down and stuff like that. So now we're getting we're, it's not all just a sort of like Hollywood blockbuster. I know with the big movies, obviously, there's a huge fra- – everything's very franchised around Marvel and DC and stuff like that. And that's fine. You know, love taking the kids to a new Marvel movie. There's been some great ones, as we know. But at the same time, what's great about Netflix and Hulu and HBO and stuff like that is they're, they're, they're taking – I hate saying risks because I don't think any of these TV shows are risks, but they're, they're doing – they're doing stuff which would would have been ten years ago considered left of center, and oh, yeah. you know, making even Wednesday, which seems so quite a straightforward, is still just like taking one character from a successful you know franchise and doing a spin off. I mean, that never would have happened ten years ago. No way, no. Jose. And it is a great, great show. Um, I yeah. love, I love that the complexity of that girl's character because they make her obviously initially. You've got that very stereotypical. She's like you know, super cold, but then you see all of the humanity in her. It's Mm -hmm. really, really well done, really well directed, looks beautiful, well acted. Yeah, Yeah, definitely my favorite show of the last few months. Yeah. Yeah, because of the way the streaming industry is, there's always a new show. There's always a new series. They're cranking these things out, but the difference, and I'm a big Marvel fan too, and I love the movies. I've seen all of them, but... What frustrates me about the big blockbusters is whether it's for the trailers and, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy, for instance. The whole thing is set around the soundtrack. And I love all those songs, you know, hear them. But people, the blockbusters still focus on catalog music, which is great. Yeah, yeah. But television and the streaming shows, they're like, no, we're going to put on new songs. We're, they, they're they tapping into new sounds and new artists more quickly and deftly than the blockbusters can. And there's still, you know, you see a trailer for a big movie and it's the same songs we've seen in trailers for the last 15 years. Oh, yeah. Years. I mean, I love George Thorogood. He was actually one of my business partners in, in my old studio, so God bless him. But if we have to hear ba 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 to the bone with another dude getting on a motorcycle, I'm going to shoot myself, you know? Right. Like, like leather jacket goes on, Eric's laughing, because we all know it. Guy, yeah. You know, and it's always like the stereotype of, like, the, the guy that's, like, rediscovering his youth, you know? He buys a Harley, puts on a black leather, ja- leather jacket, and it goes ba 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 to the bone. It's like... Or the two guys going out with a fresh suit on to go out night clubbing, and it's like "Staying Alive" comes up. All of these are great songs. <laughs> exactly. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, great songs, but they've been great well, songs on. forever and ever and ever. It's like, yo, there's more music, and I think it could, like, because shows have been able to move a little bit more quickly. Younger generations want that, right? So if you had a trailer for a new movie, and instead of the selection of 10 songs they put in every movie, they put in, I don't know, even some, a huge hit, like Steve Lacey, Bad Habit, right? What if we put that in, like, my ears would perk up, and if that trailer was just on somewhere, I would look and be like, oh, who's doing that? Someone is paying attention to what's hip now, not letting us know what was hip shit, sometimes 50 years ago. And then wanting people to stay on that same boat, it's like, I get it. But if you want my dollars, you have to meet me halfway. The industry can't just, you know, dictate what is hip and what people need to be paying attention to. The most successful things are are staying with the pulse of what's new. I agree. I mean, I'm 100% behind you. I think 
one of the misconceptions is is like the music industry is like shrinking and it's dying. I mean, there's whole channels that are built around this kind of philosophy that in the 1970s the music was amazing and now we don't know what we're doing. I mean, there's whole it's a it's a thing that if I did a video on Led Zeppelin and said it was the greatest band ever and no everybody else sucks, it would probably get a million views. And I love Led Zeppelin. I'm sure you do too. I mean, God bless them. One of the greatest bands of all time. However, there's more money being made in the music industry than ever before. It's ridiculous how much money is being generated. And there's more people that are able to make a living than ever before. It used to be when I was a kid, like I said, I've got 10 years on you, but probably you had a similar experience in like, you know, when you first started making music in the 90s as a teenager, when you, you'd you probably go to like a local studio and there was nothing else. Maybe people had a four track. It was like four track cassette or demo studio. And even demo studios were not cheap. You know, they were like, I remember going in like the first time it was like 500 pounds a day. Now, granted, it was like 1,500 pounds or 2,000 to go to a really expensive London studio. But the local one was still a lot of money for a local artist. And, and there was nothing in between. There wasn't a guy like you or I in a bedroom with Pro Tools and a really nice mic pre and a nice microphone that could get a world-class sounding record. It was basically four track, spend lots of money or even more money. And, and, and now, increasingly, you know, so much chart music and so much music outside of the pop music, because that's an easy target for people. If you say pop music, people like to it, is made in those kinds of environments. Even if it's being produced by a famous producer or songwriter, they're still doing so many of their overdubs in their house. There may be the original demo that they started with in their, in their gazebo in the back garden when they wrote with Adele or something like that, can still be what ends up being on the record. Well, there's so few artists, I think, now that don't have some kind of basic recording setup to do, whether it's demos or their own overdubs or vocals. I got a project coming up now with this fantastic singer, Fielded, and she is more comfortable recording herself. Right. And she's got a setup and she's got, you know, she's fluent in logic and she's doing it. And it's just like, okay, well, if that's how you're comfortable sitting at home and doing your takes and putting them together and they sound right, yeah. well, track the band, send me the vocals, you know? Like, we can, yeah. like if, if that's your method, then that's the method, so, you know? And, and it changes our workflow as producers, engineers, you know, in the studio. I don't want to say proper because th that's all changed now. But by the time I get files to mix, if someone is just sending me a record just to mix, that person has done so much pre-production and work on their own before I get anything. So that's a discussion I have. Okay, what have you been working on? What have you been focusing on? Because maybe they spent seven hours, you know, working on their keyboard sounds. Well, I want to know that before I open up the, the files and just start turning knobs. And, you know, I have to understand. You're raising an incredible point here about we have to, we have to be very aware of our own egos getting in the way. Because quite often when somebody brings me something, we go back to the old business model. It was like, who cares? I'm going to retrack everything. That's such a foolish thing. And why music up until like uh, the sort of mid 2000s, mid early 2000s, was so homogenized because they'd always do that. They'd always throw everything away and and just retrack everything and make it slick and lose all of the soul and 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 the energy. Now it's smart. If somebody sent you something and it's really good. Be the grown up producer that goes. You know what? I love everything about this. I just think you could retrack this thing or this element. We could remix it and just take that. Or we could just add a string section in here or, or pull out all of this stuff and put a different instrument in that section. And I think we have it. That's a smart producer. Yeah. One that knows not to throw the baby out with the bathwater and use the existing thing. That's the job now. It's not to go in and do everything, but the job is to know what needs to be done and what needs to stay because, sure, maybe that's not the greatest guitar sound, or maybe those drums sound unusual, but that might be where the soul of the record is. That might be where the funk is, where every that everything hinges on, and you go back and you can record everything super clean and X, Y, and Z, the way that we were taught, and the books say, and the videos say, but you just ironed all of the flavor and and and, and the spice out of your record for the sake of being able to say, yeah, but I recorded the guitars. 
You know, the fans yeah. don't yeah. care. All they know is that it doesn't feel good. Yeah, it's all exactly. The fan is what's going to judge the music. I would yeah. say the great American public is the one that decides whether you're going to be a hit or not. It's got yeah, nothing to absolutely. do with it. Yeah. They don't care what But I used the U87 used... on it, so it's better. Yeah, and they're like, <laughs> I don't know what you said, but the song sucks. And so it doesn't <laughs> matter. You know, all of this stuff matters a lot, and preamps matter, and what compressor you choose. But also, it doesn't matter at all if the end result isn't a great feeling record that people yeah. are going to resonate with. I think one of the things that, um, not calling anybody out, but sometimes I get, um, and it touches back on what we talked about earlier, people saying, you know, how do you find professional artists? Because I understand there's a frustration because you want, you want to elevate your music. So I know for many of us, you want to work with better artists, better songwriters, better performers, because then your music is more likely to be heard. And I totally understand that. I get it. You know, if you're just doing really bad punk rock demos of really bad punk rock bands, unless there's a, that's the big scene in your town, it's very unlikely that you're going to... Don't get me wrong. Great punk rock is great punk rock. I just mean like any genre, if you're doing the worst of it, it's not going to help. But if you hone your skills and you can make that not very good artist elevate it quite high... Like one of the best compliments I ever got was I worked with this band. I won't say who it is, um, but I worked with this band and I sent out the demo or the recording to a bunch of different managers. I was trying to get a big manager involved. I was very excited by them. And two or three of them came down to a showcase that I put on. And to a man, woman and child, every single one of them said to me, wow, Warren, you made that band sound really good. <laughs> There's a lot in that statement. There's yeah. a whole lot in that very short sentence. But I got work from one of the managers, gave me a band that I helped produce. They got signed. You know, so the rest is history. It's like, it. so it was a calling card. I took a average-ish band and made them sound as best the best they could. And the problem was, is they weren't very good performers. Live, it was boring. They didn't really have the energy that we captured in the recording. Um, but I did a great production and, and a good mix, a great mix, and it got me more work. So I think it goes back to what we were talking about. It's like our job to elevate the artist, and yeah, that's our job. Yeah, you know, and the thing is, is that no matter what you're working on that day, you got to put in your best work because you don't know who will hear it. You can think, oh, this cat is the worst rapper on the planet. Okay, that's fine. But if you can generate a good record with this terrible rapper, somebody somewhere is going to hear it. You don't know who's going to hear something. And that first time they hear a record with your name on it, that's your first impression. And right, right. Very true. You know, like the first impression thing still matters. If somebody hears a mix that I did and it sucks, it's gonna, they're going to think, oh, well, Willie Green can't mix. I know it because I heard a song that he mixed and it sucked, right? So I always want to put my best foot forward because you never really know. And if you can take somebody who's not excellent and get an excellent record out of them, that's even more of a calling card of, you know, if somebody, you know, and like, like your example comes back around, it's like, all right, well, you see what I did with them. Wait till you see what I can do with somebody else, you know? And everybody has the right to make music and want to make their records, but every, you know, we've, we've got people have their preferences and we know what we, at least in our minds know is a good record with a good artist and how to get there. And the idea is to get as close as you can to a great record every time. And, you know, people are going to hear that. And also the artist may have other friends who also want to record and we, you know, you don't know who they know. And if that artist is like, well, they took me seriously, seriously the whole time. They were always professional. They did their best work and they really gave me their all. I would happily recommend them. You don't know who they're friends with. Their friends may start calling you then and their friend, you know, and now you've made a name for yourself in your region and your scene. And then that can transcend that. By just giving a damn about the music that you're working on that day. Because honestly, I mean, what else are you going to do? Are you going to sit here and have a terrible time with the song that you're working on? Or are you going to at least enjoy the process and make it as good as you can? Sure, maybe you don't like the song, but 
Find a way to enjoy it. Find a way to get in there. And maybe you just love the hi-hat. Or maybe the bass sound that you got on there is great and you're really proud of that. All right, great. You've got something there to get you through the day. Do your best work. Because your worst work, someone's going to notice and they're going to call you on that. Very well said. I, I love this. And like, like I said near the beginning of, of our discussion, you're in the trenches. You know, I, I, hate, I hate that phrase. It implies such negativity. But you, you, this is what you, you and I have very similar, similar career paths, you know, um, albeit 10 years difference probably in, in when we started. But, you know, I'm, I'm the opposite sides of the same country. But I've, I've done the same thing. You know, I've got, I've got the, the, the major labor records there. But my bread and butter was all the independent artists and all the independent artists that I worked with on, or on small labels and stuff like that that got me to start working with some of the bigger artists. And I found, I've talked about this many times, so sorry people that are watching this and get a little bit redundant, but by the time I got to a major studio, I was surprised because the assistant engineers that had been working there for 10 or 15 years were great. Don't get me wrong. They could plug in a microphone, position it, get great tones for me in minutes. But when it came to troubleshooting outside of the studio stuff, like running Pro Tools, which they had been running Pro Tools for like 15 years, I was 100 times faster. I mean, literally so much faster because they were used to working with major label artists that would come in and it would be like doing a full take and then punching in here and then maybe nudging this and nudging that. Where I was used to working with, like you, you were saying earlier, drummers that weren't hitting evenly, that were speeding up and slowing down. You know, they wanted to play to a click, but they were nowhere near in, in it. So I'd have to do like seven playlists of drum takes, then comp the takes together for feel, for performance, you know, how evenly they're hitting it, for playing the right parts, you know, messing up this chorus building it from a second chorus, flying some of it over, taking this bar, putting it here, taking that fill, doing that fill, straightening up this section, not straightening up that section, copying the feel of this bar and making the rest of the bars feel like, you know, all of these things that I had to learn. And then I get into a major label, with a major label band in a really nice studio and I'm flying through things because they're delivering so much better. What you're doing, you know, like being quote unquote in the trenches is like, really, really super important and gives you probably far more insight, gives people far more insight of what it's like than, than, than somebody that skipped all of that. Because a lot of people, they, they sort of got blessed and, and get into the industry maybe at a certain rung up. I, I, lo I love the, the sort of hard knocks approach, if, if for want of a less cliched phrase. <laughs> yeah, but you know, that's training. That's lifting weights. You know, you don't just go out and lift something heavy. You have to build up to that and then you can handle whatever comes at you, you know. But I think it's also important for people to remember that we hear the success stories of so-and-so met so-and-so, was introduced to this person, and now they're a star and look at the world tour. Well, first off, yeah. those stories are often very condensed. But for every one artist like that, there's a literal million people out there just doing this every day and working and doing that training and that lifting to get to that point. For anyone in the music industry, but especially for producers and engineers, what do you consider success? Because when you see people like myself or people like you or anybody, and you know, we're around on the internet, we're personalities within the audio industry, you know, and I'll see my picture somewhere and credits include the roots, Wiz Khalifa, certain things. It's like, all those things are true. I did those records, but my day-to-day -day job is doing independent records for independent artists. You know, where I'm, where I'm at, the big names are every now and then, and then there's my regular day. Right. And I'm a regular person who I come into work every day because I got to make rent. I don't have all these hits that are just putting money in my mailbox and I'm just like hanging out like I go to work. And that's that's what's more normal than seeing the celebrity rock star, the celebrity rapper for every one of those people is people just out here trying to trying to get by. And it's important for people entering the industry and who've been in for a while, I think people should check in every few years. Okay, what is my current definition of success? When I first came in, it was, I need all the Grammys. I need to be working on the biggest projects. 
Then the economy crashed in 2008, and I just needed a job. I just wanted a job where I was pushing a fader and not a pencil around a piece of paper. And so that was success. Now I'm in a position, I have my own studio, I come here every day, I'm doing this full time, but, you know, I've got a child now. So now success is, okay, food on the table. Yo, daycare is very expensive in New York City. Daycare needs to be handled. Certain things. But my success is, if I can take care of my family making records every day, I won. You know, they don't need to be the biggest records in the world. You know, it's nice when they're big and it's nice when a lot of people listen and all that kind of stuff that comes with it. But when my bills are paid, that's when I know that I won. Yeah, very well said. Very, very well said. This has been absolutely superb. I hope people get to watch this because we touched on so many important things. And please, those of you that are watching it, leave some comments and questions below because these kinds of discussions are super, super important. And I think what most people want to know, I think one of the problems, not one of the problems, it's just it, it, it's just a reality. I know as human beings, we all want a quick solution. We want some, we want, we want, Willie to say some magic thing that's just going to, that's how I made 500 grand last year. I did blah, you know. I, I don't think there's a lot of a lot of really good thinking that I've been really enjoying over the last few years called compound effect. And what that is, is it's like taking small actions consistently and doing the right things all the time, creating relationships with people, um, maintaining relationships with people. Not just creating them, but maintaining them, staying in contact with people, you know, giving people their due, giving them respect, and always consistently doing the best work you can, never phoning in for the sake of it, always delivering. And it really does work because it's how you build a reputation. But I think reputation these days is also a word that I think is old fashioned. I really think that now it's just. Because reputation, I think, is always, I don't know, it's its an old-fashioned way of looking at the world. I think you, you have to let your work speak for itself, I agree, but you have to have so many skill sets now that go beyond just kind of like, what do you think of that guy? How can we surmise the kind of personality you need to be to 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 sort of succeed in this business? I know that's a really hard question. I'm sorry. I'm very bad at surmising because I'm long-winded. Uh, but yeah, you and me both, can, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> let me see if I can pair this down or we're going to be here all night. It's important to be someone that people want to work with. It feels very general, but end of the day, like we do do all kinds of things and there something may come up and it's, okay, we need artwork for this single. Well, I don't do artwork, but maybe I know some, you know, and just... You know, being able, to, being a solution-driven person, um, I think is very important for our industry. Uh, I don't know the answers to everything, but if I don't know, I know somebody who does, and that's well important. Said. I want to say yes before saying no. I can't do that, or no, we can't do that, or you can't do that. That's the worst thing to say to artists. You can't do that. They didn't come to you to be told what they can't do. They came to us because they want us to make their musical dreams come true at, to, 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 to some degree. And so that's the job. You know, the networking part is very important. And it's not just to get stuff or get a hookup from somebody, you know. And you can always tell someone hops in your DMs like, yo, I got this thing. Could you do this for me? And it's like, I don't know you. Yeah. Well, why yeah. Why do I want to do that? You're hitting you know? a good thing. Sorry to interrupt you, um, but you're hitting something that, that I, I, I think is super, super important. I, I was on a live call with the, the VA the other day. I do some stuff with the VA. And so a lot of these, a lot of these guys and girls, uh, I've got the GI bill. So they've got, they've got, they've got some money to spend on education and they want to know where to go. And we have these kinds of exactly these kinds of discussions we're having here. And uh, they, the word network kept coming up. And networking kept coming up. And I said, I actually hate that phrase because, because it's misinterpreted to exactly what you're saying, which is this kind of cold calling, email, not begging. It's usually a little the opposite. I usually get messages from people that are like, literally say, yo, you need to hear this. <laughs> I, why, I, do I need to, why? Why do you do think you, that? Yeah, I presume you get exactly the same thing. A version of that. And, and it's just, 
there are ways to reach out to people that at least humanize the interaction. Like if you just send me a link in my DMs, I'm not going to listen. You know, on my website, on the upload tab, I specifically say we don't just accept unsolicited, unless unsolicited files. Like, don't just send me stuff that's making a presumption of my time. And not that I'm so important I can't take a second out, but also, like, if I don't know you and you just come out and know it, like, you wouldn't introduce yourself to me in that way in person. You know, like, at very least say... I mean, you can start with hello. That's a great place to start. But some kind of introduction, a little bit of back and forth. You know, one of the most effective ways I've, I've found to connect with people in the industry is just to reach out to someone and say, hey, I like what you do. And, that, and, and that's it. Not with my hand out in some way, not with a follow-up of, can you do it for me? But you'd be surprised how often it just kind of, it, it's, it's refreshing when someone just reaches out and say, hey, you know, I heard this album that you worked on, the new Billy Woods album. I really, I really dig it. I appreciate the work that you do. I like the way your records sound. And that's it. I'm like, yo, like, that's cool. You know, because not I'm no star in that way, but I get hit up enough of people wanting things from me. That gets really tedious. And that's not, that's not how we interact. If I don't know you, I'm not really prone to want to just give you stuff or hook something up just because yeah. you asked that's it's, it's very presumptive and makes me not want to do that but if you can connect with me because i'm like a regular person let's talk as regular people and then we can build off of that but the assumption of well i hit you up so yeah let's build i don't want to build with you i don't know you like that it's such a tough question because people get people send me stuff all the time to listen to and they always say when you get five minutes can you check this out if I got five minutes, my daughter is sitting on my lap and we're watching. Exactly. We're watching something. I don't get five minutes. The other thing I don't know about you, I don't have time for homework. Somebody, yeah. if I've got a new project and somebody says to me, oh yeah, when you get home tonight, can you check this out? I'm like, I, I no, I, I can't. I don't have that time. I need to allot time for it. Right. It's like, and then as soon as I allot time, it costs me something. Then I'm yeah. taking away either personal time with my family, with my kids, or it's taking away time that I could be making money to feed my kids. Right. And I think right. that no matter how successful somebody that is, we have to think that way. When you're approaching somebody, you know, who was it was telling us yesterday about, um, oh, it's Bob Clear Mountain. So Bob, Bob Clear Mountain told me yesterday, oh no, the day before yesterday, it was on Sunday. He said to me that um, he was having uh, dinner with Mick Jagger in New York. And he said, somebody... It was like a constant stream every like five or 10 minutes of people. And it was in a nice restaurant. So this wasn't like, you know, these were other probably successful people coming up to him, wanting him to sign something or take a picture. And he said, Mick Jagger had a really good way of dealing with it and just being like, you know what? I'm having dinner with my friend Bob at the moment. Why don't we wait till the end of dinner and, you know, I'll meet you over there and we'll take a photo or I'll sign that thing for you. But he said he was really respectful. And, and I liked it because it told me that Mick Jagger's a good person, number one. But it also se secondly reminded me, like, I don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be that guy who's interrupting somebody's general life just because in your life this is the biggest moment because you're such a huge fan of this artist or whatever. Everybody yeah. suffers this, you know, no matter how successful it is, we have to learn how to be respectful, respectful to each other. And I think also as producers, even the artists, even if they're not very successful, you still have to treat them just the same way you would a successful artist. That's such a big thing because, you know, even the most successful people at the end of the day, they're just people. Alec Baldwin goes to the coffee shop I go to in the neighborhood. He's there like every day. You know, so I'll go in and I like Alec Baldwin. I like 30 Rock. It was funny, you know, but like... Fantastic show. At 8.30 in the morning, this man's trying to get his coffee and get his caffeine and get his day going. The same as me. What he doesn't want is everybody in the coffee shop, like, all on him. So it was interesting. He was in there the other day. And, you know, it's Alec Baldwin. So you're a lot. You're like, oh, oh, that's cool. It's Alec Baldwin. But everybody in the coffee shop, just the unspoken move, or maybe it's New York because we have celebrities around. Nobody was doing this celebrity. Oh, can you sign this? Can you do this or whatever? Because we're all kind of like, you know what? It's a small little spot. And this cast is trying to get his caffeine and get his day going. Like, everybody, you know, and, and it was a cool. And so he's 
chit chatting with whoever, but it, it it was a cooler vibe. And it's like this man's a huge star, but he just needs coffee the first thing in the morning, like everybody else, you know. Um, but the flip side of that, I think, is the most important thing about running a commercial studio. Every client who comes through the door is the most important client at that moment. They need to feel that way. And you may have a huge session afterwards or a big thing tomorrow or whatever, but every client needs to feel like they're your most important client. And, you know, that's part of what the rate entitles them to. They're paying you for your time and for for your facility and for your expertise and you don't really get to just phone that in and be like, yeah, but I don't like your rhymes, so I'm going to sit here on, on, on and look at my phone during your takes. Daniel Lanois was talking about that, saying when we did the interview with him that he doesn't he doesn't allow anybody to have phones in the studio. Particularly yeah. him, he has no no kind of uh, media, no no email or texting allowed. When he personally for him, he goes, I, he goes. Last thing I want to do is have an artist think that I'm not 100 percent into what they're doing. Even if it's a quick text or something like that, you're clearly not paying attention to what's going on. Especially like when someone's doing a take in the booth, yeah. you know, on your phone, they're in there pouring their heart out into whatever song that they're doing, and you can't be bothered to get off Twitter for for thirty seconds while they record this verse. How are they supposed to feel? When I was a kid, um, uh, my mum uh, took me to the church called uh, Christ Church Crookham, and above. The priest, there was a sign that said, there is nobody more important to me in the world at this moment than the person sitting opposite. Yeah. I think it's just a good rule in the digital world in general. We now have become so accustomed to, oh, I've got a text. Let me just get this real quick. Or, oh, let me just get this tweet off or, or whatever it is. You know, I'm sitting having a conversation with you. Yo, put your phone away, man. You know, like I oh, I'm totally like, guilty. I make that mistake all the time. I do know when I'm having dinner these days. A couple of things I like to do that are really important to me. This is a total sideline. Whether it stays in the video or not is is irrelevant. But what I do is I get my phone, um, which is should be and always in my pocket. And I have this thing where I will take it out of my pocket when I go to the bathroom and put it on the table. And then go to the yeah. bathroom, and then come back, and then put it back in my pocket, because I, I and I don't do. I just put it on the table subtly. I don't even know if the person I'm having dinner with notices I do it. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It's important to me because I realized that what I was doing myself, I was making this mistake of like I was running to the bathroom and checking all my stuff and writing emails, and then I would look at the thing, and I'd been in the bathroom for ten minutes, oh, in a wow, one yeah. hour, one hour business meeting or friend meeting or whatever it was, family. I'd been in there for 10 minutes checking emails and doing texts. And so I was like, that is just as bad, if not worse, than just checking something for 10 seconds. Oh, sorry, I have to get this. I would rather do that now if it was something important, life or death matter, than going in there and doing that. It's a weird one. I'm learning, but I still make the mistake. I still I still like see something pop up and I swipe it away. Or Yeah, I mean, and it's tough. And like, and it's tough to do and... You know, situationally, things can change. Like, if I'm watching the game when my buddy's like, oh, something came on, oh, session came in, whatever, you know. And people understand, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. If a gig yeah. if call, uh, comes in, like, yo, I got to get this email. That's why I got my first, That's that, that, was, that was what made me decide to go from a flip phone to a smartphone. I was missing emails. I was missing gigs. So I was like, I got to get this smartphone. I have to, have to be able to have this stuff come, come in. And people recognize that. But... You don't want the person across from you to feel like, all right, cool. I guess whatever's happening somewhere else is clearly much more important here. I've given you my time, but you now, you know, it just, it taints the color of your interaction because something else is going on. Important things happen. But with me, I realize I pick up my phone. Maybe I look at that text real quick. And then I blink and somehow I'm scrolling through Instagram somehow. And it's like, yo, I just wound up down. I just wound up <laughs> down this rabbit hole for no real good reason, you know? So yeah. trying to find trying to find my boundaries with it because it's just, I don't know, it's, it might just be me, but it's too much. This has been fantastic. Thanks ever so much. I hope people get stuff out of this. Please leave any comments and questions below. What I'd love to know, I'm sure you would as well, is like what everybody's personal experience is with this. Um, I'd like to know where everybody's at in their lives and their careers. You know, I feel like there's a lot of a lot of people that follow us 
professionals or semi-professionals that have may have full-time jobs and making extra money doing this or do it for a love. And, and then there's a lot of people that follow us that actually do this for a living. Uh, I know that because whenever I go out and go to AES, there's so many people that are actually making music for a living um, that come up to us and talk to us. I, this AES was my favorite AES. Yeah, it was great. You know, and actually, real quick, one more thing we're talking about how do Please. we connect with people in our areas. Um, you know, professional organizations like AES or like some of the other things out there. You know, my wife doesn't want to hear me talk about compressors. She really does not care. <laughs> but I know where I can go to a group of people like, hey, I just got this new thing. Check it out. And it could do this and Crest Factor and all that. And like-minded people. And maybe I can't do a gig, but now I know a group of people. All right, I'm not the right one for this, yep. but I know more people who can and vice versa. You know, yep. there, there are people out there to everyone watching. There's people out there that think like you and are interested in those same things. Yep. Find your people and connect with them, and then you all can grow together, and it's going to be that much easier. Yeah, I agree. And I think if you're newish to the music industry, um, don't be afraid of AES. I think when I first went to AES about 25 years ago, when I first moved to America, there was definitely a lot of ponytails and beer bellies. There definitely was. Yeah. It definitely, you'd go there and it, yeah. And that's fine because some of my best friends look like that. Don't get me wrong. But it didn't, <laughs> it didn't feel as inclusive as it does now. I think ever since John Crivet was president, um, he really changed it dramatically and brought in a ton of students. When we were there, um, you know, a couple of months ago, it was the most vibrant and diverse, in, in the true sense of the world, diverse in all genres and all age groups and like, all ethnicities and everything I've ever seen. Uh, uh, Graham Kirk, I think, has a lot to do with that. There's just a... Yeah, Graham's a genius. Yeah, Graham's phenomenal. One of my fa Also one of my favorite people. You could text him now anytime, day or night, and he'll respond. You don't know what country he is. He's just on it. <laughs> he is on it and a great, great guy. So I agree with that. I think join AES because it's not that expensive and go to the local meetings. It's yeah. interesting. I go to the LA ones, not as often as I should because I'm usually too busy. 75% of the people that go here are in film and TV. Mm, so I actually yeah. get to hear about what the, the, um, the music people in film and TV are going through. And that really helps me because that's a whole different perspective. There are preconceptions about AES, but they're just that. They're preconceptions, you know. Not everything has changed. Like, not everything has changed in the industry at large. But there are a lot of people, including myself, I'm on the Board of Governors, that are really trying to diversify all aspects of it. Not just gender, not just race, but genres and just exactly. the kind of information that we want to share and the kind of people that we want to welcome in and share the information with. It's not, you know, everyone just sitting around talking about the Eagles. The Eagles are cool, but we're forward leaning. We're looking toward the future and we want perspectives and input from a lot of people. So really, you know, check it out. There's a lot going on and a lot of folks like myself that are trying to bring in some new perspectives and some, and, and some new different life to it. I think the great thing about it is if you do what's, if you always do what's right, then everything else falls into place. So if you make it about the music and the best kinds of music, all of those things that you mentioned all, all get taken care of. Gender, ethnicity, religious beliefs, whatever, all of the diversity we have in the world just gets taken care of if you just choose the best music. If you're about making the best music, things like society can be better. And also, I mean, that's my record philosophy. If everybody in the room is trying to make the best record possible, it's all going to sort out in the wash. Totally. Yeah. If you want groove and feel, it all comes from the blues. Yeah. So it's pretty easy. It's yeah. pretty easy to do the right thing. Just make great music. As ever, always wonderful to talk to you. Yes, you as well. This is this has really been great. I'd like to just chop it up with you. We don't get a chance to chat as often as we should. So this has been great. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Please leave any comments and questions below. And let us know a bit about your story. I would love to know everybody's story. And as you probably know, I, it is me that goes through and uh, responds to people. And, and I love the discussion that we have. So, Yeah. Also, what is your definition of success? You know, when we're talking about checking that out, you know, think about it. Put that in the comments. Like... Where you're at right now for your next five years, 10 years, what do you consider success? That's an interesting thing to consider. Yep, definitely. Thanks ever so much. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. So long. Farewell. Love you to say au revoir. Adios. Ciao. Tootsins. <laughs>